Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Metcalf Institute webinar, Rising Waters, Stories from America's Frontline. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute. We will begin today with a 12-minute film called Home or High Water from Sheepscot Creative. The film is based on the book, Rising, Dispatches from the American Shore by author and journalist, Elizabeth Rush. Elizabeth, who I'm proud to say is an alumna of Metcalf Institute's training for journalists, was named a Pulitzer Prize finalist for Rising, the book Rising in 2019. Following the film, Ricardo Sandoval Palos, the public editor for PBS and a Metcalf Institute advisory board member, will lead a conversation with Elizabeth. We're presenting this webinar today in partnership with the Rhode Island Center for the Book, which selected Rising for their 2020 Reading Across Rhode Island program for schools. The scale and impact of this year's Reading Across Rhode Island program has resulted in more than 2,000 book deliveries to libraries, classrooms, and senior centers across Rhode Island, and engagement with over 3,000 high school students through classroom and intergenerational discussions. Reading Across Rhode Island would like to thank its committee, countless volunteers, and its sponsors, Fidelity Investments, New Gen Capital, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, Rhode Island PBS, Rhode Island Office of Library and Information Services, Barton Gilman, Barrington Books, Savvy Books, Rhode Island Library Association, Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, and Grimshaw Gudewich Charitable Foundation. As for Metcalf Institute, our mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and the environment. We do this through webinars like this, as well as providing education, training, and resources for journalists, scientists, and other science communicators. We would like to thank our donors and the University of Rhode Island's Coastal Institute for making this webinar possible. The short film you are about to see was produced by documentary filmmaker David Welch. Based on Elizabeth Rush's book, it provides a compelling snapshot into how sea level rise, driven by climate change, is transforming coastline communities throughout the United States and disrupting lives in irrevocable ways. So right now I will move over to that film. Bear with me. Almost there. <laughs> and here we go. If you think of the state of Louisiana, the outline of the state is sort of looks like a big boot, or at least that's what it used to look like. But over the past 50 years, a lot of the low-lying land that is the Louisiana Bayou has started to disappear. And what used to be a boot or the sole of a boot now looks sort of like lace. The three main factors that are accelerating and have accelerated land loss in coastal Louisiana are the damming of the Mississippi, the oil and gas industry, and sea level rise. They've lost uh, land equal in size to the state of Delaware over the past 50 years. When I first went down to the Isle de Jean Charles, I figured when you flood three times in five years, you leave. I mean, I thought, I thought it was like a very rational decision-making process. And I realized very quickly when I got to the island that it's anything but, and that everyone has sort of an individual pathway through that decision about leaving a place that you've called home. At the height of population density, there were about 300 people on the island. When I first got there, this guy named Chris Brunet, who's like the local island historian, was about one of 30. You know, a number of these are photos that I took of Chris's photos. All of these trees here in the photo, they're living, wonderful, 
hardwood trees. And when you go out to Chris's house, you know, a lot of this is open water and a lot of these trees are just skeletons of themselves. In Louisiana, I started to be able to see in a very like visual, visceral way that, um, that we're losing tidal wetlands species and that the things that are rooted in place and can't move away from higher tides and stronger storms are perishing. And you spend a lot of time out there and these cypress, these live oaks that are just skeletons of their former selves start to sink into, started to sink into my thinking um, and helped me sort of begin to embrace retreat as, as a necessary adaptation form. Because if you can't move away from the risk, at some point it will do you in. And I think we see that with these trees. The more I have spent time in coastal communities, the more I've wondered um, why some of them remain in place when they have repeat flooding issues. And the very simple answer is if you have a mortgage and you live in the floodplain, you are required by law to have a flood insurance policy. Those policies are all run through the National Flood Insurance Program. And that program demands that if you make a claim and you get money for your claim, you rebuild in place. You talk to people who live in these places and they'd like to leave. They're like, you know, the first flood, I used some of my savings, I redid my kitchen. The second flood, I didn't have the money to do that, so I did the basics to get back in the house. The third flood, you know, if they're going to come back into that house, it usually means dipping into their retirement savings if they have it. And at the same time, because their house has flooded a bunch of times, it's also losing value. We're talking about, you know, lower middle class people being stuck in homes that are consistently losing value and not having a pathway towards physical or financial safety. We hear a lot about how different big coastal cities are designing interesting flood resilient infrastructure. People from all of these cities meet and they information share around what's working, what's not working. And one thing that I've realized is that we really need a kind of information sharing network like that for small town America, uh, for little communities that are really far away from the centers of power. Flood Forum USA, which started in the middle of the 2017 hurricane season, has started to address that need because it really empowers those living on the front lines of, of this planetary phenomenon. Can you see my screen? We can see the screen, yes. Fantastic, okay. Uh, so just a reminder, Flood Forum USA helps people harmed by flooding get heard, organized and supported, and several of you are, are on these photos. Thank you for your work. Um, first, let me say we live on a small island. It's probably about 8 miles by 14 miles, and that's it. That's the size of the island. Um, so when Hurricane Sandy happened on the south shore, many people were impacted all over the island. According to the official numbers, 24 people died. So it is a nationwide coalition of flood survivors. And one of the things that the organizers do is they connect communities with pro bono hydrologists and pro bono um, environmental lawyers who then go out to the community, will do a hydrological assessment to try to identify the flood risks. And together, the hydrologists and the community leaders create an action plan that they can then bring to local politicians. They have um, collective power by grouping together. I think that that's a huge source of hope for me. But if we don't create the policies now to figure out how to help everyone make the transition, it will be devastating. We need the stories now that tell us how to do this and we need the policy that helps those down the line, you know, get out of harm's way. All Broad Channel residents are urged to comply with this evacuation request. I feel like I'm always talking about how important retreat is, and no one wants to hear it, but it's really important. I mean, but the alternative is like 
turn into one of those trees, die in place. Like that's the alternative. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's it more or less. And, you know, lose, lose all of your equity in the process, lose your equity, then die in place. I was teaching at the College of Staten Island when Sandy arrived. And this was for many the third storm in a four year time frame. Residents would tell me Sandy was the 500 year storm. Irene was the 200 year storm. The year before that, we had a 300 year rain event. So in three years, we've had a thousand years of storms. Their patience had reached a limit. You had nine different communities along Staten Island's Eastern shore start to petition um, the local and state government to purchase and demolish their homes. They wanted the land where their homes had stood to be, to go back to nature, to act as a buffer in the storms to come. And in three of those communities, the governor, Governor Cuomo, agreed to purchase the homes. And so over 600 homes were purchased and demolished in Staten Island after Sandy. When you, you know, relocate the residents of Oakwood Beach, you're also giving the tidal wetland species that are dependent upon that place the chance to ultimately move up and in as well. Also in a place like Oakwood Beach, if you have storm surge with a storm event, tidal wetlands can essentially slow down the water. They slow down wave action. They can make those waves less big. The waves hit the marsh grasses and start to dissipate. That's one of the things that they could have used a lot more of in Staten Island during Sandy. Because when the water came, in many places it came in very quickly. 50% of the Sandy-related deaths took place in Staten Island. Almost all were on top of places that had been tidal wetlands, but that got paved over. I think that we need to sort of get to that place where retreat isn't so emotionally loaded. And people are moving away from risk. And they're doing so in ways that can often help them maintain their community. So it doesn't have to be as emotionally or economically devastating as we think it could be. If you go back out there today, the wetlands are coming back. The Spartina alternative floor is coming back. I was last out there in June and there were a bunch of deer and I'd never seen deer in Oakwood before. There were ospreys. I'd never seen ospreys in Oakwood before. So I did really get the feeling like, you know, sort of one definition of home gave way to another and was giving in the short term um, the opportunity for these wetland species to survive and thrive. It was, it's, it was really incredible to watch. Okay, um, that was fantastic and a wonderful introduction to the conversation that we're about to have. I am very proud to introduce Metcalf alumna, Metcalf, uh, Elizabeth Rush, 
Uh, she is the author, again, of Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in General Nonfiction in 2019, as well as Still Lifes from a Vanishing City, Essays and Photographs from Yangon, Myanmar. Her work explores how humans adapt to changes enacted upon them by forces seemingly beyond their control, from ecological transformation to political revolution. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, Granta, Creative Nonfiction, Orion, Guernica, and others. She is the recipient of fellowships from the National Science Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Howard Foundation, Oregon State University's Spring Creek Project, the Society for Environmental Journalists, the National Society of Science Writers, and Metcalf Institute. She is currently at work on a book about motherhood and Antarctica's diminishing glaciers. Maybe we'll get just a little insight into that too today. Um, I am very pleased also to note that Elizabeth will be interviewed today by Ricardo Sandoval Palos, who is not only the public editor for PBS, he's also a Metcalf Institute advisory board member. As public editor, he serves as the liaison between PBS's content creators and their audiences. He's an accomplished investigative journalist and editor. He's worked for Inside Climate News, NPR's Morning Edition, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the Sacramento Bee, the Dallas Morning News, the San Jose Mercury News. In short, he has a great deal of experience um, covering not only the environment, but many other very important issues. Ricardo's passion project is the new digital platform Palabra, which means word in Spanish, which he's editing for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Ricardo Sandoval Palos. Thank you, Sunshine. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, really appreciate this invitation and this chance to spend a few minutes in conversation with Elizabeth, a fan, fanboy, here I am. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that we really focus on as editors um, is finding copy, finding stories that really take us from one uh, point of the pendulum to another. And what's really critical in that is uh, I ask my writers, I ask people who work with me to, to know what they're talking about, to understand the science if it's about science, to understand the people if it's about people. And uh, the reason why that's important is because we need to be able to translate that, but not translate it so we sound like the science, not translate it so that we sound like an outside narrator, but so that we sound like the people and the events and the, and the subjects that we're writing about. Uh, writers, when they hear from me, they always hear show, don't tell, and use the research that you've put into your piece, into your stories, use that to inform an authoritative voice. And I think that's critical because that, uh, we really want to produce work, produce books, produce articles that resonate with audiences. And what makes me feel really good today is that we have here uh, a writer who does this uh, day in and day out, and in particular, a book rising that hits these notes. Um, it's really super critical in my mind that as we get deeper into the adaptation part of climate change, not so much we know it's happening, we've convinced 99.5% of the population perhaps, except for the White House, that this is happening. We need to really work on adaptation. And in adaptation, we are gonna be running into vulnerable communities, vulnerable individuals, um, and the kinds of stories that really mark us as journalists and, and writers. So with that, you know, I really wanted to, to explore a little bit of that writing side with you, Elizabeth. And I'm really wondering, you know, in, in, the, in the writing process, when you're preparing a book, when you're coming up with an idea, there is a moment, there's a spark that stands out in which you think about it and you say, okay, I need to compile everything into a broader look, a book. And I'm wondering in this particular case, given the diverse nature of stories that you have in this collection, what was it that signaled you to turn this all into a book? 
Well, first of all, let me say thank you um, for inviting me here today. It's a wonderful opportunity to be with you all. Thank you to the Metcalf Foundation. And Ricardo, thank you for your wonderful, thoughtful read of this book and that question. Um, it's interesting. I'm so happy that we got to watch that short documentary as well, because for me, that moment, that spark where I went from sort of wanting to write about sea level rise and writing about sea level rise as a journalist to writing rising kind of, it happened right on the cusp between my reporting on the Isle de Jean Charles and my reporting on um, Hurricane Sandy in Staten Island. And I think for me, what happened was that I knew Staten Island really well because I was teaching at the City University on Staten Island when Sandy hit. And our university closed for about two weeks. And in the storm's aftermath, a number of my students were missing, went missing, um, and never made their way back to the classroom. And, you know, many lived in these low-lying coastal neighborhoods and then in the storm's wake we're in temporary FEMA housing we're in Jersey with friends and family and CSI students typically have a job and attend school at the same time and with they started to face a longer commute time to both of those things and they had a really tough decision to make you know financial security or my education and for a number of them, you know, that financial security became the most important piece and education took a back seat. And as I read about the storm in the newspapers, I didn't see that story coming up. I didn't see the story about how um, Hurricane Sandy could upset or interrupt someone's plan to get a college degree. And I thought, you know, that's a story that's also hard to get into the newspaper. It's not super newsy. It's something that you have to follow for a long time. There, you know, there weren't hard facts to support what I saw. I just had the anecdotal, anecdotal evidence in my students. Um, but that's when I kind of realized that the writing that I had done around sea level rise had a whole context around it that demanded, you know, a deeper level of engagement both in terms of research, but also in terms of the language that I could use to sort of activate those stories and, and invite readers into them. And I think for me, that was really the turning point where I said, okay, I need to start applying for grants that are going to buy me time so I can really devote um, a depth of attention to this subject that's hard to do when you have to, you know, if you're turning out a story every couple weeks, something yeah. like that. And that's interesting because, uh, you know, you, you decided to get into a part of the pool that uh, is not as well uh, swum. I, <laughs> I think I'm mixing metaphors there, perhaps. <laughs> but I'm wondering, it, it really fascinates me because uh, there is a whole body of potential sources of great stories out there that we as journalists don't often get to because we're so caught up with the day to day. Right. And, and what I love about this, the approach you took to this book was that you reached people that might not otherwise ever be heard from. Uh, like, for example, um, you know, you, you spoke with uh, um, Richard Santos in Alviso, which is a tiny hamlet of a town at the foot, <clears throat> excuse me, at the bottom of San Francisco Bay. Uh, it's, this is a largely Latino uh, community. And um, as climate change and sea level rise hit us, this community is going to be gone in, in a certain way. And it is already being threatened by development and the encroachment of Silicon Valley around it. And what about, what's often struck me about Alviso is that it has really nobody standing behind it saying, no, we're going to defend this community. And as we adapt, as communities adapt, as Norfolk in Virginia uh, adapts to or looks to city planning to solve its problems, as other places look for seawalls and other answers, uh, you have towns and people uh, like Santos in Alviso who have really nothing. So I'm glad that you looked at these vulnerable communities, but I'm wondering, is that enough to really propel? I mean, do, how do you tell a greater world that we need to care about these individuals in these places? <laughs> 
you know, it's so interesting to me because as a journalist and as a writer, as I was putting this book together, once it became this idea that I was going to write a book and I was looking for funding to support this kind of storytelling, I would always write my grant in such a way that I would ask for money just to send me somewhere for a long period of time. I was like, I don't need a fancy hotel. I'll make my own food, you know, just get me an Airbnb and a trailer nearby for like two months. And, you know, that's how I got to know Richard. That's how I got to know a lot of these people that appear in the book is by going door to door, knocking and, you know, taking the time to listen to folks and their stories. And for me, that was a transformative experience because I realized that they have precious knowledge that the rest of us do not about the threats that their community faces, but also what they want to preserve, what matters the most to them um, in terms of if you have really limited options, if you're not getting the seawalls, if you're not getting the big infrastructure solutions, you're kind of up against a very difficult set of decisions. They know that firsthand. And I think they're facing those questions with a clarity that maybe most of us have sort of bought our, or many others have bought their way out of for the present tense. Um, and I think it's really a question about what is community, what matters, how do you hold on to community through transform transformational change. And I realize that there's many things that can be preserved, even if it's not necessarily this building in this place, you know, two feet above sea level. So I think, you know, if there's something for us to take away from um, listening to these stories, it's to recognize that we actually have deep, profound, adaptive capacities as human beings um, and that we'll be perhaps less frightened by climate change and the and the transformations that it proposes, if we can tap into that fact that we do know how to adapt. We see it with coronavirus. We've all completely changed the way we've lived uh, over the past 60 days. And, you know, there are people who are on the front lines of that in a way that's different than you and I who are talking safely from inside of our homes. Um, but the changes are profound and we're, and we're working on them all the time and we can do it. Yeah, well, thanks. And, um, you know, just a quick aside for the audience and for those who, who have joined us, thank you, number one, for being with us. Um, it, you know, here we are all at home, and what else do you have to do? Come on. <laughs> no, but thanks. Anyway, uh, I just want to mention that uh, after our conversation here, we are going to be opening this up because one of the most valuable things about these, this kind of an exercise, these sessions, is to hear from you, is to hear from people who have taken the time to read the book, to understand what's going on, to many of you know the science behind a lot of this. Many of you know communities that are threatened. Many know people who have suffered. So we want to hear from you and we're going to take those questions and so we can hopefully have a really productive dialogue here. Um, you know, and that actually leads to an area uh, that I think is front and center to your work here. And this is vulnerability. Uh, you know, we, we often live in vulnerable lives in many ways, but for some of us, it's different. You know, my difficulty these days is making sure I, I have access to the gin that I need for my quarantinis, right? <laughs> but it's really different for the meatpacking workers or the farm workers out there who are the true frontline people who are making it possible for us to exist in this, in this adaptation that we have. You have some of, that, some of the elements in this book. Um, and what really struck me is your use of the first person essay, inviting people to speak for themselves, to tell their story. Uh, what pushed you to do that? I mean, I think it was a really good literary device. It, it resonates with readers. You know, I think there are two things that push me to do that. One is as, you know, a student of environmental literature, I, studied it in college as an undergrad, as a poet, um, and then later in the world of nonfiction writing. And as much as I steeped myself in that tradition, I recognize that there are, you know, a whole set of experiences that have historically been left out of it. 
So it tends in the United States to be very white. Um, it tends to focus on a relationship with the more than human world that's sort of based around recreation. And as I started to work my way into this sea level rise book, I thought, you know, initially I thought, okay, it's gonna be a bunch of wealthy white people who live on the coast. And when I was looking at the places that were feeling the squeeze of rising seas now in the present tense, it was not necessarily who I thought it was. It was um, all different kinds of communities that were living atop land that was flood prone even before sea level rise began. And that was a choice made out of financial necessity, made out of um, the need for, in many cases, like safe ground. So you have a lot of maroon communities, runaway slave communities, um, displaced indigenous communities that sought out this wet land because it wasn't desired by anybody else, because it was affordable. Um, so I started to recognize that there was a way in which vulnerable populations were married to vulnerable landscapes. And it started to feel incorrect to me to speak on their behalf um, because I also recognize that that's, you know, for me, what transformed me in writing the book was listening to those stories. And I wanted to carry readers into that experience. And that meant, you know, handing off the microphone essentially and casting a really wide net and trying to create a sort of more democratic um, conversation around what sea level rise is and how we adapt to it. So it was a transformative experience for me as well and really a reaction to environmental literature and the canon of environmental literature in this country. Yeah, I think that's really critical. Um, it's, it's, it, it, again, it underscores this need to be able to reach an audience and to translate the science to, uh, to something that people can, can feel and touch, uh, uh, you know, and even smell in some way when you start thinking about the images that you're portraying here. Um, you know, I think it, it, it really does present this question of connecting dots. You know, as researchers uh, in, in a scientific way or an empirical process can connect the dots in a, in, a, uh, in, in a timeline, say, that has points on a, on a graph. And each timeline uh, means a something in this uh, research uh, process. But a timeline in our sense, in our literary sense, in our journalistic sense, is uh, useful in telling a story. Um, What's the difference in your mind here? And from that, what should the audience take away from the timeline that you present in, in this piece of work? Yeah, I think um, you have, I think one thing that we encounter a lot in the climate change conversation and that we're starting to get a better handle on is that we have a lot of climate change facts we also can now see we've had them for a couple decades. We get increasingly more every year. And it still feels like there hasn't been the movement that we need to produce structural societal change um, to significantly curtail, slow down um, our CO2 emissions. So I think that we're collectively getting to a moment where we're going, okay, we have, we still need the science. The science is foundational because it, I mean, without it, <laughs> we're really um, waiting in the dark here, but that it alone is not enough to really change hearts and minds. And so then the question becomes, how do you get people to move towards real acceptance of the science and then to the place where they recognize that change has to happen. Um, and it's not just individual change. It's not just change your light bulbs and get an electric car. It's, you know, the world that we've built undoes us every day that we live in it and that we need to start to build a different way of relating to each other in the landscape. And I think that, um, one, one way to do that is to make these voices central to the conversation that have not necessarily been central to the conversation to 
again, sort of kick the door wide open and say, you know, this affects all of us. It, we are not all equally vulnerable, but we are all, we all experience the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat, right? Um, and so we have to figure out how and who we want to become through this transformational change that we're living right now. And I think storytelling actually plays a big part in that because it can help us identify common ground, um, places where my desires and needs overlap with yours. And when you can come at the conversation from that place of unity, you can actually accomplish quite a bit, I think. Um, so, I, And I think we're starting to get there. Yeah, I think that's a strong point. And it actually takes us to one of the first questions that we have here from the audience. We have Mary who's asking, and this is, I think, central to one of the, the, the theme that goes throughout the book is that there's a change going on. And how do we, how do we manifest it uh, as humans? How do we adapt as humans? But how do we show this as journalists and, and observers? And, and, the, and Mary's question is, can you share uh, an example of a coastal community and its adaptation to climate change? Is there one that really stands out in your mind right now? For sure. I mean, you saw a little bit of it in the film. Um, for me, what happened in Oakwood Beach, Staten Island, was really transformative to watch. So, as I mentioned, you know, it, Staten Island is a working class community. Um, and in the storm's wake, a number of different, in particular, you know, the lowest lying communities along the on the eastern, southeastern shore of Staten Island started to say, we're tired of living in the floodplain. Every time we flood, we're always very low on the city's list of priorities for places to get aid to. Um, they knew with Sandy that they were gonna be at the bottom of that list again, and that that would mean five, 10 years of waiting for recovery funding likely. Um, and they said, we don't wanna live here anymore. We want you to purchase and demolish our flood prone homes. And for me, this was really surprising because um, you're also talking about a right leaning set of communities. You're talking about communities that in many places, when I went out and first initially spoke to people said, you know, I said, is climate change causing your flooding? Or what do you think about climate change? I would try to sort of uh, phrase my question very gently. <laughs> um, and, you know, folks would say stuff to me like, oh, I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to comment on that. All I know is that there's more development and there's more flooding. And there was this real interesting evasion of committing to or responding to questions around climate change and its impact on their lives. They would say, but we do flood and we flood more. Um, right. And so, you know, they came together. You had these coalitions of hundreds of community members doing public protests, writing to the governor, asking to have their communities demolished. And the governor agreed, and he purchased and demolished over 600 homes on Staten Island after Hurricane Sandy. And what was really fascinating to me was that I went back probably three years later and I met with all the leaders of all of those different community-led grassroots movements. And they all still lived on the island. We ate at like the same seafood restaurant that we always ate at. And I said to one of them, I said, you know, Joe, how many people, what percentage of people do you think stayed on the island? And he was like, I don't know, 80%. And my reaction to that as a journalist was like, there's no way that's correct, but <laughs> I'm glad you think a lot of people stayed on the island. It's a really high number. And um, like three weeks later, a study was released that indeed 79% of people stayed on the island. And so, this meant that, you know, a lot of the folks that I had been in touch with in the reporting process, I was able to communicate with again, and they got to keep their community. They still went to the same butchers. They still saw each other on the weekends. They still, you know, went down to the pier to fish. What had changed was their immediate vulnerability to flooding. And I asked at that lunch, I said, you know, what do you think of the seawall that the city wants to build? 
And another one of the community leaders said, we know seas are rising, the climate's changing, that's a temporary solution. And for me, that was a mind blowing moment. I thought something really significant has changed. And it's not, people often ask me like, oh, is it when people experience flooding, what might change a climate change denier's idea of what climate change is? And I would think back to Oakwood and say, you know, it's not, they knew they've been flooding more and more since the beginning. I think what changed was that they gained agency over what they wanted to do about it as a result. They chose as a community the plan of action they wanted to go after and someone heard them and helped them fund that solution and then they didn't have to give up their identity as staten islanders they got to you know continue having the same jobs so i think that there's something in there really profound around what happens when you empower a community to make the decision about where they want to go and how they want to navigate this change. And it can, I think, move you from, you know, that space of denial or fear towards acceptance and, you know, moving on with your life. I think that that's yeah. really profound. I, and I think, though, in a, in a way, too, it, it presents another uh, challenge to us as writers, to you as, as a writer. And it reflects a question from Robert in the audience that, you know, writers like like you and, and others like Stanley Robinson, in a sense, are asking communities to say goodbye, right, to a life that they knew, to the communities around them as we know them. And, and, and so they, Robert's question is, can we begin to plan to address all of this in an equitable way? How can we communicate these challenges in a way that empowers and unites us behind these great, to, to face a great challenge? Because it's, the tendency is to divide, right? And do your own thing, like the government is asking us to do right now in the face of this pandemic. You know, so I think that it is possible. And in some ways that, that gets at this question about sort of like leaving the agenda behind around what you think a community should do. Like I went down to the Isle de Jean Charles and I thought, oh, well they should move. <laughs> and you know, that is not a useful thing to hear if you're a member of that community. And so one thing in response to that question that I think of is um, an initiative that happened, gosh, it was about a year ago, it was made public in Louisiana that um, the state itself was going to identify places that would be a high priority for retreat, a medium priority for retreat, and a low priority for retreat. But before they did that, before they made public those maps, they started to hold community charrettes and community conversations in all of these different communities and ask residents, you know, you know you're facing sea level rise, you know you're facing land loss and erosion, what would you like to do about that as a response? And they had, I think, 10 to 12 different communities in their pilot project. And they said, we're gonna give you like not small sums of money, we're gonna give you real money to choose two responses that you wanna test out in your community. And we have no say over what those are. Um, so there were a lot of communities that would, for instance, choose retreat in one area and choose a seawall in another area. We want to put a seawall around the marina and we want to retreat, you know, move away from, have a hundred residents move in this area. And I think in some senses, to a planner that, that might seem like insane that you're going to address sea level rise with two very different solutions. But to that community, it was a deeply thoughtful process around what they want to hold on to for you know, even if it's 20, 30 years and what they want to start to give away, what they're willing to give away um, in order and sort of how they're gonna balance that dance. Right. And I was surprised as the, as the state rolled out these maps that showed you know, areas again that are high levels, high priorities for retreat, there was very little pushback um, to them. And I think that's in part because they took the time to have a series of conversations before that and to empower communities to respond in ways that felt useful to the community members. Mm -hmm. hey, you know, it's interesting that you, you bring up um, 
the way you talk about this really kind of points to something that I think is critical for us as journalists and, and writers when we're exploring these issues is a word that I see in one of the questions from the audience, empathy, mm. right? The ability to empathize with the people that you're talking to or that you're meeting perhaps very often for the first time. Um, and that leads to this use of uh, literature as opposed to sheer journalism and a scientific regurgitation of what you found. Um, and I think what people are saying in the questions and statements that they're posing here is that they love the literary aspect uh, of, of your book. Uh, one passage really struck me in that vein, and that's when you're speaking to, um, <clears throat> you arrive in Louisiana, and you're speaking to Chris and his sister Teresa, and you point out that as Chris is talking, there's a fly that's buzzing around his head, like a, like a ball and a string, you know, and it really kind of brings home where you are. And you read on in that passage, and you're hit with this, uh, a few paragraphs later, you find out why you're there. That 40 years ago, a dolphin would have never thought or been able to come up and swim to that point where you were in the bayou. Um, yeah, it, it, and it really kind of brings home this question. Um, how do you marry literature and this kind of um, poetic writing? How do you make it work in such a heady topic as sea level rise? Oh, that's a difficult question um, and is one that there's, I think there's sort of no one answer to. And I think my writing in Rising doesn't necessarily propose like a one for one solution, um, but it makes me think my brain goes to two sort of separate anecdotes um, that happened while I was at work on this book. One is that, you know, I remember those initial meetings with Chris and one thing that really cracked open my conversation with him was when I said to him, um, I'm in the process of leaving an abusive relationship. I had been in an abusive relationship and I actually left like two, a week before I went down to Louisiana. Um, and so I said to him, you know, I know what it's like to have something that you love also be the source of pain. Um, I get that. And when we started to have this conversation around what it meant to be hurt by something you love, the conversation completely shifted. And he could suddenly tell me what it meant to have the land that he has spent his entire life on top of flood um, you know, cause damage to his home, cause damage to his relationship with his friends and family. And it's also the thing that sustains that very set of relationships. So I started to recognize that there are ways in which I could understand some of the vulnerability that comes with flooding, even if I didn't have a direct one-to-one -one relationship with it myself. And I think that that's a thread that kind of runs through this book as well is, you know, it might seem like a problem that happens to those folks over there, but the reality is we all know what it's like to um, have a complicated relationship with something that we love and to have that thing change its shape over time such that it maybe doesn't serve us anymore. And so I tried to certainly weave that through the book as an entry point for a reader who might not live in a vulnerable coastal community to say like, oh yeah, I do get what this is about, even if I don't know exactly what it's like to live through Hurricane Harvey. And I think that that's something that a scientific literature just doesn't have, no one has endowed it with the magic wand to be able to do that thing, but that, you know, literature can do. Um, it can create those metaphoric bridges. And I think those but, are- but, but even in all of this, uh, come on, Elizabeth, and even all this, I could, I, I got a feel for a, a, a nerd in there. There was a science nerd <laughs> wanting to come out and talk, right? Uh, for sure, and, and, there is also that science nerd, for sure. <laughs> And uh, how how do you make that science nerd then reach people? Uh, uh, a real brief uh, explanation of the translation that you that you use to go from nerd to hey, being able to 
really resonate with an, with different audiences? I think sort of two things there, you know, um, as I mentioned, like I did a lot of this reporting initially sort of more as a journalist. And the science nerd comes out a bit more in the journalism in terms of like, okay, I've got to figure out a straightforward way to communicate the risk that this community is facing and how it relates to climate change. So in many cases, I wrote the story straight first so I could like sort all the facts in my mind and get to know the science. And then once I had steeped in it for a while, I could kind of switch the register to a more poetic register, a more lyric register, and think about how can I make these same arguments, but with a different veneer over them so that it would have that broader, wider reach. Um, the other thing is that I just read all my work out loud. And as much as I love to nerd out, um, on the science of climate change, when I read my work out loud, I grow bored by that writing pretty quickly. And so um, I know that, for instance, I probably can't sustain <laughs> a deep, heady scientific register for more than like two or three paragraphs without boring myself, without boring my, my reader. Um, but that's something that I can only recognize when I hear it. Because when you're on the page, you can kind of silently move through it more quickly. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the part about, I don't know, flood barriers. <laughs> what, do you what do you think of the word um, fear, right? And Richard reminds us, Richard from the audience reminds us that there's a passage in which he describes a young boy in the boat uh, when the, it comes time to capsize, right? And, uh, and he says, oh, I can't because I'm afraid, that, I'm afraid of being in over my head. And your reflective response to us as readers is, well, me too. Uh, <laughs> and is, is that something that also drives you uh, in, in how you shaped the characters and how you shaped the stories here? I think absolutely. Um, I think that sensation also of fear, of despair, of being overwhelmed by what I was learning. It's very interesting to me because that is certainly a place that I remember being, but it's also one that I almost feel like I've moved through um, the longer that I work on this subject. And the more I see people engaging with it, the more my fear has transformed into a kind of like radicalized hope that we as a society can make these profound transformations. But initially, it was fear, it was overwhelm, it was despair. And I think that that's a really natural reaction to being told, you know, uh, the overwhelming majority of species on the planet are going, ex like will probably go extinct as a result of this um, change that we're setting in motion. Right. So maybe not overwhelming majority, but a huge percentage Enough of, of it. them. Yeah. So you know, I, I think it's important. You're, you're touching on a, a theme that's coming through in some of the questions from the audience here. There's a question about, um, it, you know, uh, politics. This is the ugly specter of politics is actually going to dictate a lot of, of, of our adaptive moves here. And there are people who are in the verge of being left out. So there's a socioeconomic question there too. Um, but then we have governors and we have local leaders who are really active and into this and into trying to figure out a solution, not just for their communities, but also for neighboring areas. So I'm wondering, do you believe on a, on a grand national scale, are politicians doing enough right now to get us to where we need to be as a nation? I mean, no, I absolutely don't think they're doing enough to getting us to where we need to be as a nation. Um, I also think that Well, my response to this question would have probably been different a couple months ago than it is today. But I think that to expect them to do all the work is also perhaps to miss the work that they haven't been doing for the past 50 years. And to, I think, you know, what inspires me 
are these grassroots movements, are the sunrise movements, are the fact that people are waking up to the power that they have as collectives um, and that we can understand that we might share vulnerabilities amongst and between groups that haven't historically been thought of as necessarily sharing vulnerabilities. So is this a social justice problem? Is this an reproductive justice problem. Um, yes, it is all of these things. And I think that we're starting to recognize that if we can call it out as such, then there is a larger body of interested people for whom they can demand a kind of political change that a politician right now isn't giving us. Um, so you know, I have a good friend who's an environmental reporter in DC, and she said to me when I was on book tour, I stayed in her basement, um, which authors do when they go on tour, they're like, I'll sleep anywhere. Um, she said to me, you didn't quote a single politician in your book. And I hadn't realized it. It was never an active decision. And she was like, that's what I love about it. You were like, I'm done with talking about climate politics. Let's really shift who gets to talk about this thing and on what terms. And I think that that's part of what I think is promising about the present moment is that we don't have to keep expecting our politicians to do all the work for us. We're starting to recognize that there are limits to that. I'm wondering too, this, and this is a question that comes from someone who's a, uh, an environmental reporter in the audience as well that wonders if there's a generational divide in all of this that feeds into the socioeconomic divisions. You have people, and she's, uh, or this individual reporter has heard people say, um, I'm going to go down with the ship. You know, this is my land. We're staying here regardless of, of what come hell or high water, as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, and other folks who are saying, hey, you know, we honestly want to defend ourselves and defend our, our, um, uh, our, our land. And then there's the group that says, get me the hell out of here, but mm -hmm. I can't. Um, is that a clear uh, point of division uh, in, in this whole discussion? And how do you, as a journalist, um, approach each of these? Is one more valuable than the other for you as a journalist? One story. You know, um, I would say no. <laughs> they're all equally valuable. I definitely also know the people who want to go down with the ship and who say, and I think rightly so, but who I am is tied to this place. And um, I'm thinking of a guy named Edison who lived out on, who lives out on the Isle de Jean Charles. They've been given um, tens of millions of dollars to relocate in as a group. Um, they're Biloxi, Chittimacha, Choctaw. They have a deep tie to this land. And it is, they've literally lost 95% of the land mass over the past 50 years um, of where they've made their lives. A lot of folks have already left. A lot of people are going to be part of this relocation. And Edison says, you know, he's in his early 70s and he's like, what, you're going to move me inland so I can like basically fish in a pond and grow old fast and watch TV. Like, no, I'd rather die in my home where I've made my life. And I can't tell, you know, yeah, I get that. <laughs> That's right. really important too. You well, get to Elizabeth, you know, I think we're getting to, toward the end of our time here, but I'm really kind of curious to come away with this and a, a, a note to, or a tip for the, for the youngins. Uh, so I'm a high schooler, say, and I really want to get into uh, writing about uh, climate change. What do I do? Where do I start? Um, is there a question that I ask myself? And let's wrap think, up with that. Yeah. I think the question that I always ask myself, whether it's climate change or whatever other story I'm covering, is first read a lot in that subject matter and then ask yourself what's been left out. You know, and I think one way to also figure out what's been left out is to spend a lot of time in the place or with the people that you want to incorporate or have be part of the story. And I think you kind of need to do that research 
beforehand. I like to go into a community knowing the threats that they might face. But that way, when I listen to the stories that are originating up out of that land, out of that place, I'm tuned to, oh, what's a difficult story that has been left out of that narrative and how can I create space for it? So, you know, the question about, is it important to also hear about folks who want to stay in place? Absolutely, because that sometimes gets left out and that's just as important as the folks who are willing to leave. I think, you know, it's a little bit about checking what you want the story to be at the door, steeping yourself in the research, and then going and listening to the actual lived experience of folks in these places and, and moving from there. Well, Elizabeth, thank you very much. And that's something really good to take away and for us to walk away from this. Uh, uh, you, you know, and we can all ask ourselves, I'm, I'm going to ask you, what's next? Uh, you know, uh, we're going to be watching. So if, uh, if we can move from that to an end to this, uh, I think it'd be great to hear uh, what's in your notebook. And then we can- Sure, I mean, I'm gonna give you a visual. So hold on. What's next is that I'm growing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the short version is that I got sent by the National Science Foundation to Antarctica last year to participate in a really groundbreaking set of um, scientific experiments that were conducted on the calving edge of the Waits Glacier, which is considered ground zero for sea level rise this century. No human beings had ever been there before on the planet. And um, so I was there for about two and a half months last year. And now I'm writing this book that's about glacial loss in Antarctica and the decision to bring a child into the world right now. And it's running these two parallel stories alongside one another until they... Very interesting tracks there for us. Yeah. That's sunshine. So, Take us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much, Ricardo Sandoval Palos and Elizabeth Rush. It's just been such a pleasure to, um, to listen in on this conversation today. So thanks for sharing your time with us. Thanks to all of you who tuned in today for sharing your time with us. I would like to again, thank our partners at the Rhode Island Center for the Book um, and, um, and all of you for being here and all of those um, donors who helped to make this possible. We will have another series of webinars coming up in June. So if you check out metcalfinstitute.org or sign up for our monthly e-newsletter from the website, you can be aware of all of the things that are coming up. Until then, uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you.